Upload the AP Knee film with radiographic marker into the templating software system. Identify the radiographic view, side to be templated, and calibrate the image. Determine the AP resection lines for the femur and tibia relative to the anatomic axes. For this video, the proximal tibial resection is perpendicular to the anatomic axis and the distal femoral resection is in 5 degrees of valgus relative to the anatomic axis. Having a templated image also provides a visual reference to compare to the resected bone. Measure the distance between the IM cutting guide and the lateral femoral condyle. While most surgeons prefer a 5 degree distal femoral cut, I routinely use a 3 degree distal femoral cut to provide improved lateral soft tissue stability. Upload the lateral knee film and calibrate the image. Measure the depth of the anterior femoral cut relative to the tip of the anterolateral flange of the distal femur. In this example, there is a large amount of anterior trochlear bone which will be removed during the procedure. Evaluate for posterior femoral osteophytes. A measurement of the amount of posterior tibial slope can be performed on the lateral radiograph. However, I routinely do this as an intraoperative measurement. Describe steps of the procedure to the attending prior to the case. Describe potential complications and steps to avoid them. Confirm that all necessary surgical instrumentation is on the back table and sterile. The patient is placed in the supine position. A thigh tourniquet is placed as proximal as possible on the operative leg. Both arms are secured to well padded arm boards placed at 90 degrees of abduction. A foot holder plate is placed such that the knee bends to 90 degrees of flexion. The ipsilateral leg extension is removed. I prefer to stand at the foot of the OR table, so I use a table with a removable leg extension. The non-operative leg is padded and secured to the bed with tape. An ipsilateral hip bump is placed so that the patella points straight toward the ceiling. Secure the patient's torso with a seat belt attached to the bed. A Mayo stand is brought in from the head of the bed on the non-operative side. Cover the Mayo stand in each arm with two quarter sheets. Isolate the operative extremity with an adhesive impervious drape placed just distal to the tourniquet. A stockinette is used to grab the foot from the circulator. An adhesive drape with tails is placed over the impervious drape distally. The foot is placed into a foot holder and secured with a wrap. An adhesive bar drape function as the upper drape for anesthesia. A blue towel with suction, bovi, pulsed lavage, and clamps is opened and secured to the mayo stand, which is now covered by the upper drape. An adhesive drape is used to cover all exposed skin on the operative limb. The leg is elevated and the tourniquet is inflated. Mark the medial aspect of the tibial tubercle. Mark the medial, lateral, 
proximal and distal patellar borders. Draw a midline longitudinal incision from 2.5 centimeters above the patella through the middle of the patella and to the medial border of the tibial tubercle. Making the incision with the knee in 90 degrees of flexion produces a shorter incision which provides adequate exposure. Instead of drawing out the intended incision, I find it easier to make a straight central incision just proximal to the patella continuing to the tibial tubercle. Create the planned skin incision with the knee flexed. If preferred, this can be performed in extension as well. Use electrocautery to perform the subcutaneous dissection down to the level of the extensor mechanism. Develop medial and lateral full thickness skin flaps. Assistant retraction facilitates medial and lateral flap development. Proximally, the VMO fibers should be identified as should the medial aspect of the patella. It is often easier to identify the lateral border of the patellar tendon insertion than the medial border. Identifying the lateral soft spot gives visual confirmation of the entire patellar tendon insertion thickness. Identify the medial quadriceps tendon, the VMO muscle fibers, medial patella, and medial tibial tubercle. Place finger at the lateral soft spot and palpate the medial patella and the border of the patellar tendon to define the arthrotomy. Mark the planned arthrotomy with bovi electrocautery. Once the intended arthrotomy is marked with the bovi, Perform the medial parapatellar arthrotomy with a scalpel along the planned incision. To aid in subsequent closure, 5 millimeters of quadriceps tendon is left attached to the VMO. Likewise, a 5 millimeter cuff of retinaculum is left attached to the medial border of the patella. Care must be taken distally not to incise the patellar tendon or its distal insertion. Using a scalpel, Release the anterior horn of the medial meniscus and partially release the superficial MCL fibers directly off of the proximal tibia. Once this is done, extend the knee. A small right angle type retractor can be placed and retract the entire medial meniscus and MCL sleeve. This will ensure that the dissection is directly off of the tibial bone. The extent of the MCL release depends on the deformity. A general rule is to carry out this dissection to the mid-coronal plane of the tibia. More severe degrees of varus malalignment will require more release of the MCL sleeve. It is important to realize that in a valgus knee, the MCL dissection is kept to a minimum. Release the fat pad from the proximal tibia. Flex the knee and place medial and lateral Holman's retractors. Resect the patellar fat pad in its entirety. Release the ACL, PCL, and the lateral anterior meniscal horn. I routinely resect the PCL for all total knee replacement cases. There are three steps that I pay particular attention to during total knee arthroplasty. They are femoral rotation, balancing the flexion and extension gaps, and tibial rotation. Place the knee in 90 degrees of flexion. Introduce the distal femoral intramedullary canal reamer. This is best placed in the anteromedial corner of the intercondylar notch in line with the trochlear groove. Set the femoral rotation with the intramedullary rotation guide and mark this with bovi electrocautery. When setting femoral rotation, the primary landmark is perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the tibia. Secondary checks 
include Whiteside's line and the transepicondylar axis. The goal is to perform femoral cuts parallel to the eventual cut surface of the tibia in order to achieve balanced gaps. Insert the intramedullary alignment guide and orient according to the previously marked rotation. Again, this anterior femoral rotational cut should be oriented perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the tibia with the knee at 90 degrees of flexion. Because this anterior femoral cut is externally rotated with respect to the anatomy of the anterior femur, there is a tendency to notch laterally and take excess lateral bone. It's best to place the anterior stylus on the anterolateral femoral cortex to avoid notching laterally. The anterior cutting guide is placed and secured to the IM guide. This should be oriented perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the tibia. An oscillating saw is used to make the anterior femoral cut. The grand piano sign confirms adequate resection. The grand piano sign refers to the resulting cancellous bone pattern. This is longer laterally than medially and resembles a grand piano shape. Remove the anterior cutting guide and place the distal femoral cutting guide. Secure the distal femoral cutting guide with pins and remove the intramedullary alignment guide. Retract the medial and lateral skin flaps with retractors to obtain adequate distal femoral exposure. An oscillating saw is used to perform the distal femoral cut. Make sure the cut is complete all the way to the posterior femur. The desired amount of distal femoral valgus alignment is based off the intermedullary alignment guide. As a general guideline, after the distal femoral cut, the remaining cancellous bone bed of the condyles should approach one another centrally. If the cancellous bone meets across the middle, the femoral cut may be excessive. Maximally flex the knee and place medial and lateral retractors to expose the joint space. A narrow PCL retractor is placed along the posterior tibia and levered to sublux the tibia anteriorly. The PCL retractor is important to gradually produce anterior subluxation of the tibia and maximizing exposure for the tibial cut. Occasionally, particularly tight knees cannot be adequately subluxed and the tibia must be carefully cut in situ. The tibial cutting guide is positioned with an extramedullary rod. Note that anterior subluxation of the tibia externally rotates the tibia with respect to the femur. It is important to place the tibial cutting guide in the same rotation as the final position of the tibial base plate. The alignment rod is oriented from the tibial tubercle to the center of the ankle. The depth of resection is set using a stylus, then the appropriate tibial slope is determined. An angel wing stylus can be used to assess the posterior slope based off the medial tibia as well as the depth of the planned resection. The alignment rod is removed. and an oscillating saw is used to perform the tibial resection. Proper retractor placement is important and will avoid cutting the important collateral ligaments or popliteal artery. The tip of the saw blade should be visualized during this cut. When approaching the posterior aspect of this cut, place the leading hand against the tibia to provide better control of the saw blade. A broad, straight osteotome is used to elevate the resected tibia. A spiked clamp is applied to allow for manipulation and the resected tibia is stripped away from any remaining soft tissue attachments. The resected tibial bone wafer can be compared to the planned tibial resection. Place the extension gap block on the proximal tibia 
and bring the knee into extension. Assess leg alignment, extension gap symmetry in the medial and lateral planes, and stability. Flex the knee to 90 degrees and insert the flexion gap block. Mark the planned posterior femoral condylar resection. Place the appropriate sized 4-in-1 cutting guide on the distal femur and mark the planned posterior resection. This resection line is then compared to the line made previously with the spacer block. The femoral rotation has previously been determined by the anterior rotational cut on the femur. At this point in the procedure, the anterior cut should be parallel to the tibial cut. Small corrections can easily be made to the femoral rotation by slight angular changes of the 4-in-1 cutting guide. Femoral component sizing is determined by the 4-in-1 cutting guide. The posterior cut matches that of the flexion gap block. Medial lateral sizing is also aided by the 4-in-1 cutting guide. If the 4-in-1 cutting guide appears too large in the medial lateral plane, a smaller size needs to be used. Slight shifting in the anterior-posterior plane make this downsizing possible. Secure the 4-in-1 cutting guide with two threaded pins. Use an oscillating saw to perform all femoral cuts, taking care to avoid femoral notching. Femoral notching is best avoided by beginning the anterior cuts on the medial side where less bone is removed and slowly moving towards the lateral side. Remove the guide and use an osteotome and rongeur to remove bone from each cut. Place the femoral intramedullary retractor and open the flexion space with gentle distraction. Resect the lateral meniscus, resect the medial meniscus. The medial meniscus has an attachment to the medial collateral ligament. Carefully resect the medial meniscus away from the medial collateral ligament. Care should be taken removing the medial meniscus from the medial collateral ligament. With the joint distracted, remove posterior femoral osteophytes and any excess posterior bone with a curved osteotome and mallet. A curette and rongeur is used to retrieve the loose bodies and any removed bone. Local anesthetic cocktail can be injected into the posterior capsular region, superficial MCL, and distal femoral periosteum on both the medial and lateral sides. To prepare the tibia, maximally flex the knee and place the medial and lateral retractors. A wide PCL retractor is used to bring the tibia forward and provide complete tibial visualization. Perforate any sclerotic bone at the tibial surface with a smooth pin to improve cement fixation. Secure the appropriate size tibial tray to the tibia in proper rotation with two pins. A good target for tibial rotation is between the medial and central third of the tibial tubercle. Anterior subluxation of the tibia pushes the tibia into an externally rotated position with respect to the femur. It is important to realize this so that the tibial base plate is placed in enough external rotation. Use a rongeur to remove tibial osteophytes. The proper intermedullary guide is attached to the tibial tray and an entry reamer is introduced to the appropriate depth. A keel punch effectively maintains the rotation for the final implant.
The tibial guides are removed and the trial tray is retained. The trial polyethylene insert is placed. The PCL retractor is removed and the tibia is reduced in flexion to access the distal femur. The appropriate sized femoral trial component is placed and seated with the mallet. The medial to lateral position is assessed and adjusted as necessary. Ensure proper extension gap balancing. The knee should be able to fully extend, indicating no flexion contracture, without hyperextension, indicating a loose extension gap. The trial components should not extrude in full flexion. A liftoff sign indicates the flexion gap is too tight. Perform manual AP stress testing with the knee in 90 degrees of flexion. Manually assess the varus and valgus stability in full extension, which is the extension gap, 30 degrees of flexion, and 90 degrees of flexion, which is the flexion gap. Once the proper trial component sizes and positions are confirmed, the femoral pegs are drilled through the trial. Use the oscillating saw to make the femoral trochlear cut as needed. Extend the knee, evert the patella, assemble the appropriately sized patellar reamer, remove marginal osteophytes with a rangeur, and set the desired resection depth. The patellar reamer clamp is placed flat against the everta patella to ensure even reaming in all four quadrants. Position the drill guide preferentially superior and medial on the patella to facilitate proper tracking of the implant. Drill lug holes through the appropriate patellar drill guide. Flex the knee and replace the medial and lateral retractors. Remove the trial plastic with a small osteotome. Remove the trial femur. Irrigate and clean the femur and place a dry lap pad onto the bone surface and replace the wide PCL retractor. Remove the tibial tray and pins with a wide osteotome. Irrigate and clean the tibial bone surface and dry with a lap pad. Place cement into the tibial keel hole and digitally impact it into the cancellous bone. Once the tibial component has been coated with cement, impact it into its final position and remove excess cement. Dry the tibial tray with a lap. Insert the desired polyethylene insert and lock into place with the inserter and the mallet. Remove the PCL retractor and reduce the tibia. Apply cement to the end of the femur and digitally impact it into the cancellous bone. Use a small instrument to identify the femoral peg holes. The femoral component is coated with cement. Impact the femoral component and remove excess cement. Extend the knee and irrigate and clean the patella. Coat the patellar component with cement. Place the patellar component and patellar clamp and remove excess cement.
irrigate the wound and obtain hemostasis with electrocautery prior to closure. The arthrotomy closure is performed with interrupted vicral suture and reinforced with a running quill suture. Subcutaneous closure is performed with a simple interrupted vicral suture. Local anesthetic is injected into the joint as well as the subcutaneous tissues. Subcuticular closure is performed with a running monoderm suture. Derma bond is placed along the incision, followed by stereo strips. A prefabricated silver dressing is applied. Webril and ace bandages are applied.